Hello, and a warm welcome to our webinar, which goes out to our customers, students, interested engineers, and our competition. My name is Emilio Meza, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar titled Power Module Rel Reliability Power Cycling. Power module reliability could be limited by its ability to withstand repeated load cycles. This webinar introduces the concept of power cycling, its effect on power semiconductor modules, and shows how to predict when a module may fail. During the webinar, Paul Drexich will discuss failure modes related to power cycling, applying the latest lifetime models, and some examples of how packaging technology can improve lifetime. Your presenter today is Paul Drexich. Paul graduated from Rochester Institute of Technology with a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering in 2006. From 2007 to 2014, he worked as a design engineer in Simicron's Solution Group, designing power electronic subassemblies. Paul now serves as the Applications Manager and is responsible for troubleshooting existing systems and, ad and addressing new customer designs. Enjoy the webinar. Paul, the floor is yours. Thank you. This webinar is intended as an introduction to the concept of power cycling, so we'll start with some definitions and explanations of the physical mechanisms. Then I'll show you the major failure modes caused by power cycling, and then we'll get into how one tests a product for power cycling capability. This is followed by an explanation of the mathematical model for predicting the number of power cycles to failure. And then lastly, I will show some examples of technologies that are improving the robustness of power modules. So if we consider a population of installed product operating out in the field, there is a graphical way of describing the failure rate of that population at any given moment in time. Reliability engineers call this thick blue line the bathtub curve due to its shape. Uh, and it's the sum of three failure types shown here as three dashed curves. This dashed bronze line represents early or infant mortality failures, which might include manufacturing defects. This dashed black line represents random failures that are constant throughout the life of a product. And for power semiconductors, uh, a common example is failures due to cosmic radiation. This dashed red line represents the wear out of the product and defines the end of life. The power cycling failures that we're gonna discuss today are this third failure type. Our focus in this presentation is industrial power semiconductor modules, primarily fast switching types with an IGBT, MOSFETs, or diodes, above the nominal current rating of maybe 10 amps or so. The majority of these modules are conducted as shown in this cross section of an example semix module here, where starting from the top, we have an aluminum bond wire ultrasonically welded to a semiconductor chip via a thin aluminum metallization layer. And then this chip is soldered onto a direct bonded copper substrate, which consists of a sandwich of copper, ceramic, and copper. This DBC, direct bonded copper substrate, is then soldered onto a thick base plate. And obviously there are other packaging technologies out there, some omitting this base plate and some with different materials, but this construction is still by far the most common in industry and illustrates the wear out mechanisms that can be applied to all modules. Lastly, I want to define the term heel as shown in this close up of the wire bond here as we're gonna use that term later. So in operation, the semiconductor chip generates heat that flows down through the base plate. And this heat causes each of the materials in the assembly to expand. And that rate of expansion of each material is defined by a coefficient of thermal expansion, CTE. The formula for linear thermal expansion is shown here, where the alpha term is this CTE. The L is the starting length and the uh, delta T is the change in temperature. And since it's a change in temperature, we're gonna be using this Greek letter delta. And since the magnitude of one degree Celsius is equivalent to one Kelvin, you're gonna hear me referring to these delta T's uh, in Kelvin throughout the whole presentation. <laughs> 
Uh, so since each material has a different coefficient of thermal expansion, the materials expand at different rates. And so this causes stress where the two materials are joined. As the electrical system in the load varies, uh, the chips cool and the materials contract. And this process of heating and cooling defines these temperature cycles uh, that we will use to describe power cycling. Uh, and lastly, as a side note, some of you might be thinking that if we're able to match the CTEs of all these materials, we can get rid of all the stress entirely. And while that's partially true, even if all of these materials had the exact same CTE, there would still be a temperature differential uh, across the materials because the assembly is not heated uniformly. Therefore, we would still have stresses within the materials because that delta T term would vary for each material. So at this point, I want to distinguish between what we call power cycling and thermal cycling. So if we consider a power module mounted to a heatsink, we define power cycling as the process wherein the semiconductor chip is the source of the heat, as would be in a real world application. And this heat causes a temperature gradient across the module as heat flows from the chip down through the base plate and out through the heat sink. That is to say, different parts of the module are different temperatures. So if we turn on this module at full power in a 25 degree Celsius ambient, and it's dissipating some known amount of power in the form of conduction losses across the silicon, we might get a 100 Kelvin rise in the junction temperature above the ambient. This 100 Kelvin delta multiplied with the CTE of silicon for an example one centimeter length results in an increase of 3.5 microns and some associated stress where the chip is soldered down to the DBC substrate. On the other hand, the copper base plate down here will not reach the same temperature as the IGBT chip and might only see a 55 Kelvin rise above ambient. Since copper still has a large, larger CTE than silicon, there is a larger change in relative length. So let's contrast that concept with thermal cycling, where an unpowered module is placed in a temperature chamber and it is then heated and cooled by means of the temperature chamber itself. So you would start at a 25 degree Celsius ambient and then heat up the oven and wait until thermal equilibrium was achieved across the entire module. And this means that all of the materials are seeing the same delta T. In this case, that's fine for the IGBT since it's seeing the same 100 Kelvin rise in temperature as it did in the power cycling test. But the copper base plate which only had a delta T of 55 Kelvin before, now has a 100 Kelvin delta T and a much larger change in length here, 17 microns versus that 9.4 microns before. So that base plate to DBC solder joint is potentially seeing a lot more stress than in the power cycling test. The thermal cycling test has value in evaluating construction techniques and is done as part of the qualification test the module manufacturer would perform on a new module. However, because the distribution of temperature across the module does not represent the application, it is not used as the basis of modeling lifetime. The focus of this presentation is understanding and modeling the behavior in this top power cycling situation. So before we get into testing the power cycling capability of the device, we need to understand what the actual wear out modes look like. Now, normally there are a lot of things that need to go right before power cycling becomes a concern. As any of you who have been around power converters for more than five minutes knows, there are plenty of design, quality, and application issues that can cause a system to fail before it reaches its expected lifetime. So short circuits, loss of coolant, high ambient temperature, high humidity, lightning strikes, pollution, all of these things are topics that usually need to be considered before we even start to worry about power cycling. But if you can manage to avoid all these things and get to the end of life, that right side of the bathroom tub, bathtub curve we uh, showed earlier, then the module will eventually fail and the primary failure modes are shown here. 
wire bond fatigue, solder degradation, and to a lesser extent, metallization reconstruction. At the beginning of this presentation, I described that want bond wire foot and pointed out the heel, and here's why. As a bond wire and chip heat and cool, everything flexes, and a common point of failure is near the bend just before the bond wire is welded to the top side chip metallization. This mechanical fatigue starts as a crack, which increases the electrical resistance, uh, which causes a higher voltage drop, which causes additional losses, which causes more heating, which increases the stress. And I'm showing this here as a cyclical process that starts to accelerate once it begins. And eventually that crack turns into a full break uh, and the bond wire breaks off as shown in this bottom photo. And like all power cycle failure modes that I'm about to show you, the end result, if le left unchecked, uh, is thermal destruction of the chip. And this means that in the case of power cycling failures in the field, much of the evidence of power cycling can be destroyed. Uh, also, please note the use of my references here with number one. The references are all listed in, on the last slide of this presentation. So similarly, we can have cracks that form horizontally in the bond wire foot where spring force eventually pulls the bond foot right off in what's called lift off. And part of what determines whether the failure is a heel crack or a lift off is the shape of the bond wire loop, which is called the aspect ratio. But the development of this failure mode and the end result is the same. The other major failure mode is in the solder layer itself, either between the uh, chip and the DBC substrate or between the DBC substrate and the base plate. So the solder can either crack along the interface to the copper or the solder itself can break down. It sort of takes on a chalky consistency. And this is most noticeable in an ultrasonic image of the module where deteriorated solder shows up as a contrasting color versus the consistent shadow that you would expect from a new module. And this behavior is sometimes referred to as delamination when it begins at the outer edge of a chip and moves its way in. But on chips with larger areas, it's actually possible for that uh, degradation to occur right in the middle of the chip uh, as that, that's where the temperature differential may be the highest. Of course, this degradation process can be looked at as cyclical as well with the electrical resistance from the chip down to the DBC increasing. But in the case of the base plate solder, it is the thermal resistance instead of the electrical resistance uh, in the, to the plate that's increasing. So in certain devices that can be accelerated by electrical characteristics that increase losses at higher temperature, but most simply, uh, higher thermal resistance means higher temperature differentials and higher CTE induced stress. And again, the end result is the destruction of the chip. So slightly less common than the last two failure modes is what we call metallization reconstruction, which occurs in the top of the semiconductor chip where there's that thin layer of aluminum. So power cycling, particularly where high currents occur, and high currents means above the surge current rating of the device, can cause the individual aluminum grains in the metallization to extrude. And bear in mind that silicon and aluminum have two very different coefficients of thermal expansion. Uh, so there's a lot of thermal mechanical stress at that interface. The images shown here are black and white optical photos. And you can see that reconstruction appears as a darker area on the chip versus the normally shiny metallization here. So if we zoom in on that surface using a scanning electron microscope, we can see the individual IGBT cells have begun, become distorted by the grains of aluminum as they stick up out of the surface of the chip. This is the before here, and this is the after, after millions of cycles. Uh, and so that uh, extrusion here increases the electrical resistance laterally across the metallization, and it also reduces the functional area of the IGBT chip as these individual cells get distorted. <clears throat> 
less IGBT area means higher conduction losses and higher temperatures driving more reconstruction. Again, a cyclical process that results in overheating on the chip itself. So now, how do we test for power cycling? So there's a test that has been developed to heat and cool a device in a controlled manner. And this test forms the basis of all the results and predictive models that we're going to discuss. In this diagram here, it's an IGBT that's being tested. The IGBT is held on with a DC source at the gate here, and a load current here, shown in red, is pulsed through the device. The magnitude of this current is selected so that the conduction losses in the device give you a certain temperature rise, a delta T that we discussed earlier. The module is mounted on a cooling plate of some type to reduce the junction temperature back to its starting point when the load current is not flowing. So we're actively cooling this device. So we have a measure, we have a method of accurately heating and cooling the device at a fixed interval, but we also need a measure, method of accurately measuring the temperature. Now, fortunately, semiconductor devices have a temperature dependent forward voltage drop that we can characterize in a completely separate test by taking the device and uniformly heating and then measuring the voltage drop so we arrive at a table of voltage drop versus junction temperature. Then going back to this power cycling test, we can continuously pass a very low measurement current here shown in blue, which is not enough to heat the device, but is enough for us to be able to measure the voltage drop across the device here. So immediately after that high current pulse, we measure the voltage drop and we get the hot temperature for that temperature cycle. And then as that device cools, we get the cold temperature right before we hit it with another high current pulse. So the device is being heated and cooled and we are measuring a TJ min, a minimum junction temperature and a TJ max. Now, this definition of minimum and maximum needs a little bit of a closer look because it's going to be the basis for the predictive model that we discuss in a moment. So power cycling is defined in terms of the semiconductor junction temperature. We're talking about the junction of the device. And so what I'm showing here is a single cycle where the device is heated for a certain on time, a heating time, a T on. And the junction temperature is going from a minimum to a maximum and back to a minimum value, the same starting minimum value. Our delta T that we define is simply Tj max minus Tj min. And there is also something called the medium junction temperature, Tjm, that's defined as the midpoint between the minimum and maximum. So we have three parameters here. T on, delta Tj, and Tj medium that define a single temperature cycle. Now, the actual power cycling test then is pretty simple because we are just heating and cooling the device until it fails. And so shown here is exactly that test result for a mini skip module where an IGBT chip is starting at 100 degrees Celsius minimum it's being heated up to 150 degrees C, and then it's being cooled back down to 100 degrees C. And so this gives us a delta T of 50 Kelvin and a medium junction temperature of 125 degrees Celsius. And in this particular test, we were testing two devices, the top and bottom IGBT shown here in red and blue. Uh, and we have the forward voltage drop that's being measured as the device's power cycle. So that's what you see in red and blue here is the forward voltage drop for either the top or bottom device. You can think of this as an IGBT half bridge module. So as we said earlier, the voltage drop is used to give the junction temperature and we're showing the maximum temperature up here in dark red and dark blue. 
Um, but the voltage drop is also used as the criteria to determine when a device has failed the test. And so the criteria is actually a 20% increase in the forward voltage drop above the starting value. And so in this test, we can see a failure is actually beginning to happen in these discrete steps where the voltage drop is jumping up very suddenly towards the end of the test. And so what's actually happening here is you have individual bond wires are lifting off or, or the heel is cracking, it's breaking, and you're getting these 100 millivolt jumps in the voltage drop as each bond wire breaks off. And so you can see for this test, we've started at 1.8 volts, and then after more than 400,000 cycles, the voltage drop has increased to over 2.1 volts. And so it's been a failure of the test. We've just defined our power cycling test. And now we're gonna look at uh, the actual model that we can use to predict lifetime. So we've discussed the mechanisms, we've discussed the test. So let's talk about how we predict when that module will fail. So you might be wondering how we know that the delta TJ and medium junction temperature are even parameters worth looking at for power cycling. In the 1990s in Switzerland, ETH Zurich was involved in a large study instigated by the traction, that's the rail industry, to understand power module failure modes. And a major outcome of this develop was the development of the power cycling tests that we just described, along with an equation that models the observed failures. So this equation includes two pretty well-known models, which are the Coffin-Manson law that explains fatigue crack growth in uh, materials, and the Arrhenius equation here that relates reaction rates and temperature. And the important thing is that the two main variables that you input here are the junction temperature swing for each cycle, you can see it here is delta Tj, and that medium junction temperature Tm shown here. And these other parts are constants or technology factors that you plug in. So the output of this equation is the number of cycles to failure. And if we plot this, we see that uh, here on the x-axis is the delta Tj here in Kelvin. And on the y-axis is the number of cycles to failure. And you see there are three different lines here. The dots represent actual experimental points, but these three different lines are for three different medium junction temperatures. And because this is a logarithmic scale on the x-axis here, you can see that it's the delta Tj that really has that strong influence on the number of cycles to failure. Now, since the original Lesson model was defined, a lot of other factors have also been found to influence power cycling, and these are shown in the latest model here. And this model is really described in detail in application note 21001, which I'll link to at the end of the presentation. You can get it on our website for free. Um, at, but you can see here that delta Tj and TJM remain as the primary variables. Now with that T on or heating time that we defined earlier. And so Semicron has derived this particular model from a very large pool of power cycling tests that we've done over the years on a variety of different module types. And the differences in construction between those module types are factored into this technology scaling factor. And uh, as we discussed before, we still define a failure as a 20% increase in on-state voltage drop. And so in the range of heating times, T on, that this model has been validated for, the actual failure mode ends up being either chip solder degradation or bond wire crack liftoff. And as with any failure rate, prediction, this model has to be looked at as part of a bigger statistical analysis. And the particular coefficients that we give are um, valid for a 15% uh, failure rate. And so two of those additional terms in there that are not in that original Lesit model uh, are 
the low delta T behavior and the heating time. So looking at this uh, power cycling with a low delta T, so a small uh, temperature swing, if you thermally model, for example, a fixed speed motor drive, you'll find that the junction temperature is actually oscillating at the fundamental output frequency. So maybe 50 or 60 Hertz for a fixed speed motor drive. And depending on the load or cooling configuration, that Delta TJ might be five or 10 degrees Kelvin. And if you plugged in that five or 10 degrees Kelvin with the 50 or 60 Hertz rate, uh, uh, and, and uh, you plug that into the older Lesit model, you might find that the module would be predicted to wear out after just months of operation because you're racking up 50 or 60 temperature swings every minute. But we know from fixed frequency motor drives that have run for years, decades in the field, as well as from lab experiments, that this is just not the case. So the new power cycling model downplays that influence of low delta uh, uh, of delta T's at the lower temperatures. You can see here below 40 Kelvin or so, the rate uh, starts to increase, or the the uh, number of cycles to failure increases. And somewhat related to that is the effect of heating time, since higher frequencies also have shorter uh, heating times. Tests have shown that longer heating times give lower number of cycles to failure, as well as changing the failure mode from purely bond wire failures to more chip solder and base plate solder failure modes, and uh, what we call somewhat long power cycling. The model we have here has been validated with our test data up to uh, heating times of about one minute. So uh, let me show you first a, a simple way to apply this model just so you can understand that the equation is not as scary as it looks. And we're going to use a very simple example of a three-phase inverter, perhaps a motor drive, and we're using three basic 62 millimeter modules, one per phase, they're each half bridges. And for, for this example, we're going to put each phase on its own heat sink. And I've just chosen some generic parameters here, a 650 volt DC link, 400 volt output, five kilohertz switching frequency, driving a resistive load at 50 Hertz. And so we run this motor drive at a steady state, 125 amps RMS output. And then we apply a 10 second, 200% overload before returning back to 125 amps. So it's just, we're running along at steady state. We hit it with a 10 second overload, and then we go back to steady state. And this tool I'm using here is our semi-cell thermal calculation tool for calculating uh, losses and junction temperatures. It allows us to input a point by point load profile here and has our catalog modules in it. So uh, it, it makes it easy to do. I'll link to this at the end. This is free to use on our website. So in this example, we have a balanced three phase inverter. So we only need to look at either a diode, one diode or one IGBT. And for this particular condition where we're driving a resistive load or with unity power factor, the worst case happens to be the IGBT. So that's what I'm showing here. And what we see is that the IGBT, it's at 95 degrees under that steady state 125 amp condition. And we hit it with that 200% step load and the junction temperature rises up to 144 degrees. And then after the overload, if we wait roughly 13 seconds or so, we get back to that starting temperature. And so from this temperature excursion, we can derive the three items we need to plug into our power cycling mode uh, model, namely that delta T of 49 Kelvin, a medium junction temperature of 119.5 degrees C, and a heating time or an on time of 10 seconds. So the next step is plugging those things into the model along with all of the constants that are relevant for the module construction. 
So these constants are all given here on the right. And this comes right out of that AN21001, that, that application note I showed you. And because we're using that 62 millimeter semi-trans module, these values are valid for a module with a copper base plate, soldered chips, and aluminum bond wires. <clears throat> so we plug that in and we see that we get a number of cycles to failure of 526,627 cycles to failure, where each cycle is that 23 second load profile. And so you could extend that to say that you could repeat this load profile continuously for 140 days before there's even a 15% chance of failure in this IGBT. Now, there are six IGBT switches in each inverter, and perhaps you have some large number of these inverters operating in the field. So you can quickly see that although we've started with this, this becomes a uh, statistical exercise, which I'm not going to get into here, but uh, it, just to give you an idea, this, this is just the starting point for a bigger look at uh, uh, reliability theory in general. Now, in some cases, the calculated temperature profile will be much more complex as that junction temperature varies with load and frequency. And here we might have multiple temperature swings occurring over one total load cycle, which we're going to call a mission or a mission profile. And so what we do in this case is that we need to break down that uh, complex load profile into individual temperature swings. And then for each individual temperature swing, we can derive our own delta Tj, medium junction temperature, and heating time. And the way you do this is with something called the rain flow counting method. Now, rain flow counting, uh, rain flow counting is pretty complicated and deserves an entire lesson unto itself, but I'm going to try and summarize it uh, for you here. And so this, this method was developed back in the 1960s and the 70s by a Mr. Endo and a Mr. Matsuishi in Japan as a method of analyzing mechanical fatigue data. And when we apply that to our data, which is a temperature data, the basic idea is that you plot the junction temperature versus time. And we can rotate this 90 degrees and you get this shape here that looks a lot like the roof of a pagoda, which is a building design in Asia. And then you can visualize drops of water flowing down this roof here, where each droplet starts at, in this case, the minimum value starting on the right here. So we start on the right side of this graph and we have droplets of water flowing down and there are a set of three or four rules that you use about where the droplet comes together with an earlier droplet or if the droplet falls off the edge of the graph that allows you to count partial delta t's so we just have a partial delta t because the junction temperature only goes up to one point and doesn't come back when we're counting it and so you do that all for the right-hand side of the graph, and then you move to the left-hand side of the plot, and you start again with your water droplets starting at the minimum values here, and you end up with a whole set of semi-cycles, okay? And you take those semi-cycles and you can match them up if they have corresponding uh, values or corresponding uh, uh, deltas. And you end up with a big list of delta Tj's uh, heating times or uh, T on times for each cycle and some uh, maybe some remaining semi-cycles at the end. And so as you can imagine, this is, this is a relatively complex process and you don't do this by hand. Typically you do this with a dedicated computer program or a uh, Excel or Python program that uh, looks through the data. But for our simple example that I just showed you, I can show you the results here. 
So once your rainflow counting is completed, you end up with this list of delta TJs, each with its own uh, TJ medium and each with its own uh, heating time here. And so all of these cycles I've counted here happen to be full cycles. So two semi-cycles make up one full cycle. And for this very simplistic example, we have these five values. And since we have a delta TJ, a TJM, and a heating time, we can just apply our loss model that we looked at earlier and get a number of cycles to failure that are valid for that particular cycle. If we take that number of cycles to failure for just that temperature cycle and take its inverse, one over that value, we get the effective quote unquote stress per cycle. And we can then take the inverse sum of all of these and get a total amount of stress due to all of those cycles. So this value at the end here represents the cumulative stress of all of these cycles together. Now, some of you have maybe already noticed that in this particular example, the number of cycles to failure for the entire mission is pretty close, or in this case, exactly the same as the number of cycles to failure due to this major delta T of 30 Kelvin shown right here. And that's exactly the point of what I'm trying to show you here is that when you have uh, complex temperature profiles, you can very often ignore smaller variations or take a lower resolution of a data set that focuses only on major temperature swings. So you can simplify your data set and then you can simplify your calculation effort. Also, this particular example too, because of the values we've chosen here, also really reinforces how those tiny delta T's of five Kelvin have an insignificant uh, impact on life with the new model. You know, we have a comically large amount of cycles to failure and a very small contribution to this. But you can imagine if these were larger delta T's that you might have a different distribution here. Now, lastly, let's talk about a little bit about what we can do to improve uh, the power cycling capability of, of modules. So I'll show you some technologies that Semicron has developed to improve that power cycling capability. Since we know that solder is one of the weak points in terms of degradation to the thermal stress, one of the obvious things we can do is replace that solder with something that's more robust. So notably a layer of sintered silver. And sintering is the process by which we take a powdered material and we compress it with a little bit of heat until it becomes a solid mass. But we're not actually melting the material. Uh, since what we're looking at is just applying sintering to the backside of the chip down to the substrate, we call this technology single side sintering. And while there are a few manufacturers doing this today, we've been doing this in series production since about 2009. And as you can imagine, the trickiest part about this process is repeatedly doing this sintering without cracking the semiconductor chip since you have to apply a large amount of pressure here. We use this construction in our skim and skip four modules as well as some of our upcoming advanced modules. The other weak point we discussed is the aluminum bond wire. And so one method is to change the aluminum to a material with a lower coefficient of thermal expansion, such as copper, and thus you would have less stress on the bond wire joint with each heating and cooling cycle because the bond wire is expanding less. Now, copper is difficult to reliably ultrasonically weld to a chip with that aluminum top side metallization because you need a little bit more pressure and you risk damaging the chip. And so the solution for us is to uh, clad that copper wire with a thin layer of aluminum so you get a wire that on one hand doesn't expand as much as heated, but on the other hand can still be welded to standard chips using standard production equipment. 
So we don't require a special copper topside metallization and we can utilize the same bond wire equipment in our production line. Now, although aluminum clad copper wire bonds help, we'd like to get rid of bond wires entirely, not only due to power cycling, but also current limitations and module stray inductance. So to recap, uh, in a standard industrial module construction, what we have today is bond wires on the top side and solder on the back side. Uh, and in our, what we call our double-sided sintering process, we replace not only the uh, chip solder layer as described before, but we also replace the top side connections to the chip. And instead of bond wires, what we use is a flexible layer with conductors in it, similar to maybe a flexible PCB, if you've seen that before. This allows for a much larger contact area on the top of the chip to be centered. And in addition, it also reduces the loop area in, our, uh, in the conduction path in the module and hence the strain ductus in the module. Now, due to the cost and complexity of this technology, this is presently only available in our, our high volume automotive product, but uh, perhaps in the future, this will be more widely adopted in, in other uh, product lines. Now, the lifetime model I described earlier is, like I said, is fully defined in this AN21001 in, in much greater detail, and it also has the parameters for other module types. And our uh, application MOP manual uh, also has a deep discussion about reliability in general and gets a little bit more into some of the topics I've touched on, uh, and also describes some of those earlier life cycle models that were in between the LESIT curves and the uh, lifetime model that I described today. Uh, and please take note of all of the references in this presentation, as even our, our latest power cycling model is built upon years of research from a number of really intelligent individuals in academia and industry. Uh, power cycling remains, to a certain extent, uh, an academic topic. So uh, if you're interested in this, uh, I highly suggest you hop on uh, uh, IEEE or other places that are very good, very good articles and, and research papers on this topic. Um, and so with that, I would like to conclude this presentation and I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to listen. And I should also mention uh, Dr. Arndt Vintrick and Dr. Uwe Scheuermann, both of whom are responsible for a lot of the original research that Semicron has performed in the field of power cycling and the development of that power cycling model that I showed earlier. Very good. Thank you very much for the presentation, Paul. That was very, very great. Um, and I'm saying that I have a ton of questions here. Um, so I'll do my best to get through all of those. And just to let everybody know, um, I did share the PDF for this presentation. You can find that by clicking the icon down below with the three dots that says apps and then clicking on handouts to download that PDF. Um, and then there was a few people asking, and I tried to answer where I could about the recording of this presentation that will be available immediately after we are finished here. Um, so you will be able to find that there with the uh, with the webinar link. So with that, let's start going through some questions. And I might have to cut this off at some point because there, like I said, there are quite a few. Um, and I think you also planned your presentation well because a lot of these questions were answered later. So we'll loop back on a few of them and uh, go that direction. So just to, just to start off at the bottom here. Um, there's one question and I make sure I understand it properly. It's about combining power cycling and thermal cycling. And it was when you were talking about the, 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 the coefficient of thermal expansion, there was power cycling, there was thermal cycling. Someone was asking, well, could you combine these? So not sure exactly how to ask that question, but, um, is there a combination of these two that would apply? <sighs> In, in terms of modeling the life, it's it's really more accurate to stick with power cycling where you're actively heating the chip. And if you want to stress, for example, the base plate solder more, that, that that's usually done with longer uh, 
temperature cycles. So I mentioned our model's good up to 60 seconds. Uh, you know, in your power cycling test, you can certainly uh, heat up to longer times on the order of minutes. And that allows the heat, of course, to get down in the base plate and things to warm up a bit more. And uh, you'll, you'll have much more base plate solder induced failures and things like that. Um, the, the, the downside for testing that, of course, is from a, from a manufacturer standpoint is it takes a long time to do those tests. You can imagine if you're, if you're cycling, uh, you know, once every few minutes and it's hundreds of thousands or millions of cycles that can, that can take a long time to do the test. The thermal cycling test, we would, we, we do this as a separate test and it's really intended to just evaluate the materials and construction. So I would look at these as two different tests. One is to try and look at realistic lifetime in an application. The other is to evaluate, again, construction techniques and things like that, because you're really artificially stressing uh, the base plate you know, you're artificially stressing these in ways that you would not in, in the real application. Mm -hmm. And I'll say, going to the next question, because that fits pretty well. Speaking about construction, um, someone asked, is, is there a possibility to use material alloy for the base plate, for example, which better fits the CTE based on the different delta T during power cycling? For example, uh, base plate 80 degrees C versus silicon dive 125 degrees C. So a more matching CTE. So, so yes. So in uh, higher performance modules for like the traction environment, again, railway, trams and trains and stuff, uh, this copper base plate is replaced by an ALSIC base plate, aluminum silicon carbide base plate that has a lower uh, coefficient of thermal expansion. And so that, yes, that, that is absolutely an option. Um, the, the two issues, one is, of course, is cost of the material. Uh, two is that, as I mentioned here, even if you do match those CTEs perfectly, you know, say you match the base plate to the solder and you match the solder to the copper, et cetera, et cetera, if you had those all the same coefficient of thermal expansion, uh, because there's a temperature gradient here, you're going to be heating the part closer to the chip more than you'll be heating the base plate. And so the change in temperature the change in length due to the temperature will be greater in one section of the module versus the other. So you'll you'll still have some stress, but it does help. I would say the main the main thing to look at is just the the cost and availability of the materials. Mm -hmm. Copper base plate is just by far the, the, the most common and cost effective for that right now. Mm -hmm. And then um, following up on there's a, there's another question I think you might smile at. Um, when sending a, uh, a field return back to suppliers for analysis, we often get electrical overstress as a result. <laughs> exactly. Uh, is, it, is it possible to, to, to close back to pre-damages like, like bond wire cracks or solder de degradation after the failure, which could have been short circuit? Due to overheating and stuff? So, so yes, and, and as an applications guy, I can uh, empathize with all of you who have gotten the failure report back from us or any other vendor that says EOS is the cause of damage. That's very frustrating uh, and, and something I argue with people about all the time. Um, one way, you know, assuming the module hasn't been turned into a big pile of soot, one of the ways we check for power cycling is with something called a bond wire pull test, okay? And so a good bond wire, if you put a little hook around here, you can pull up on that bond wire and it should uh, yield only after a certain amount of force on that bond wire. So one of the, uh, one of the big things people do in power cycling tests um, is you can look at chips nearby and do a bond wire pull test. And uh, you could also, through um, uh, and through ultrasonic imaging here, you can look for degradation in either the chip or the base plate uh, uh, with with ultrasonic imaging. So, uh, in in certain cases, it will be possible to to analyze for power uh, the effects of power cycling, even if a chip is blown up. Um, but again, it, like anything, it depends on the level of damage there. Mm -hmm. um, then there's there's a, a slurry of questions. It, you were talking about the the 
basically the, the power cycling testing that, that we do. Um, and so I'll say the starting question is, how do you choose the sensing current for IGBT and, and silicon MOSFETs? I, I, I'm not as experienced with the exact value, but the idea is that you're talking something on the order of milliamps here. And the, the main criteria is that the sensing current can't disrupt the temperature for the measurement. Um, so you, you don't want to heat, you know, when, once you've removed your load pulse that's doing the heating, you don't want to um, in, induce further heating with the measurement current. So it has to be low enough that you're not heating the device. It has to be high enough that you can measure a voltage drop in a somewhat noisy environment because you're pulsing this on a test stand over and over again. Uh, and even more important than the magnitude of the current is deciding how long you wait um, before you take the measurement because there's other things going on here like uh, uh, carrier effects in the semiconductor itself that you have to worry about that the carriers, the charge carriers have to evacuate before you, you've uh, uh, you've uh, taken your measurement, but you can't wait so long that the, the chip has started to cool. So uh, I, I would say it's it's arrived at experimentally, but it's typically on the order of milliamps. Okay. Um, so there's a few of these questions and you did answer some of these, like what the reference T on time is for these tests. Yeah, so uh, when these models, so like this Lezit curve and the curves you'll see in our application manual that don't talk about T on time or don't have T on as a dependency, they were typically done on the order of two seconds or so. That was that was sort of arrived at as, as a, a value that could be, that was effective and was done, um, that could be, uh, that could allow a test to be completed in a reasonable amount of time. This model, like I said, we've gone back and validated this against the huge amount of tests that we had. So we have all these tests that Semicron has done, and they have varying heating times and varying other parameters, and the model was adjusted to make sure it fit the data. And so um, we say we're relatively confident that the model we have here is accurate for heating times of approximately, what is it, 70 milliseconds to 60 seconds. That doesn't mean that the model doesn't work at higher heating times or lower heating times, but we have not been able to validate it experimentally. Okay. Um, I'm jumping around a little bit. Um, this is an interesting one. In your in your lifetime model at slide 22, um, if you need to estimate the IGBT's lifetime with a long time scale, such as the annual wind uh, farm mission profile, how do you ensure that the parameter T on is done precisely? I think you've done that before as well. Well, again, I guess that goes back to, to the topic we just discussed. So the, the model itself is valid for 60 seconds. Um, once you get into long, and, and the model is valid for 60 seconds and it's valid for these failure modes here. Like I said, chip solder fatigue and bond wire failure. And the for longer temperature cycles or longer heating cycles, rather longer heating times, that's when you really start to get into base plate degradation and things like that. And right now, there's not that many accurate models out there. We don't have a model for, for long times like that. Um, there are curves that exist on the market that have been estimated, but like I said, the primary problem is that just doing the test, you know, uh, is uh, very time consuming. So it might be, you know, six months worth of testing before you get data to, to validate that. Um, now, we do, the, the, we do longer term temperature cycling like we discussed earlier um, that's that's closer to what we would call power cycling where you're putting the module in in, in a uh, oven but um, I guess the short answer is uh, you, you push the model as far as you can go you try and put on put in the higher on times and you will see based on this term here this T on dependency that 
we sort of get a flat line in the model after, I don't know, dependent, depending on the type of module you have after anywhere between 10 and 100 seconds. So um, that's definitely a, a, a realm that deserves more research. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I get one question down and three more come. So let's no, try keep, this Keep one. asking. I've got, I've got plenty of time. A half bridge module, should we test each position separately or turn both on together? And for each switch position, if there are multiple dies in parallel, how should we view that? So uh, everything we've, Semicron data sheets uh, and everything we talk about is an effective switch, even if it's three IGBTs in parallel, because, uh, or three IGBT chips in parallel, or, you know, four diodes in parallel. So we only want to talk about individual switches when we're talking about this. Um, and then in terms of doing the test, this is where it gets a little tricky because it's not often that customers are actually going through the trouble to do uh, this test exactly here. Um, if you do, you're doing it as sort of an academic type test where you're looking at just one switch position. Um, now, uh, so yeah, to, to, I guess to answer your question, the model looks at one switch at a time, but as you can imagine in a converter, you may have different losses in different switches and different positions of those switches on the heatsink. And so what that means is you're gonna have different TJ, uh, Delta TJs and different TJMs for those different positions and maybe even different heating times depending on how the circuit is operating. So, um, you know, normally what we're really concerned about is is the worst case, right? You know, even even in this example I give later on, I only looked at the um, the worst case IGBT here. It's a symmetrical balanced three phase circuit. So I assume that it's, it's the same for top or bottom uh, and the heat sinks I have show are, are ideal. So all six of these switches would see the same values, but it might well be that if you're doing series cooling that perhaps one phase is hotter than the other. And then that's the one of concern because that's the one that's gonna reach end of life before other ones. But um, yeah, it, it becomes complicated when you have more switches. If you can imagine a three level converter where we have multiple switches uh, and, it, and, then I, and then like I said, it becomes also a statistical thing too, um, based on the switches that you have out there. Mm -hmm. And in this example here, so going to a 200% overload for 10 seconds, um, the question is ultimately what would, um, what would happen or what would you need to adjust if you're going from an operating switch um, frequency of five hertz instead of 50 hertz? So, yeah, I didn't show it here, but what in our particular tool here, what I'm showing you is a very simplistic value here. And to be completely honest with you, what I'm showing you is the maximum junction temperature, okay? And in reality, like I said earlier, what's happening is um, even at 60 hertz or 50 hertz, because we're at a 50 hertz output, what's going on is the junction temperature is is oscillating at that 50 hertz, right? And that's not shown here. It would be an envelope where, uh, you know, you have the minimum temperature here, you have the maximum temperature, and then the junction temperature is oscillating between those. In this case, that doesn't matter because like we discussed earlier, small junction temperature swings have very little impact on the lifetime. If this were a, maybe the primary, the, the uh, rotor side converter on a wind turbine, you might see uh, very large temperature swings at five Hertz. So you, if you can imagine my cursor going up and down here, we would have these giant swings occurring at five Hertz then you are getting into this situation here where we have to start decomposing that into the individual temperature swings because at five hertz if the junction temperature is swinging you know 30 or 40 kelvin with each cycle you can really quickly uh, accrue stress on that module and so um, 
yeah, wind turbines are a good example of that. Elevator drives, uh, servo drives, um, to a lesser extent, stuff like welding, uh, uh, medical power supplies, things that are doing pulsed operation. Th those kind of applications do have much more complicated waveforms and you have to deal with them by doing a decomposition of the, the temperature uh, profile. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to cut the questions off here because I have to cut it off at some point. Um, and the rest that we will certainly get to by email. Um, and of course, we will see if we can compile these for future webinars. Um, but other than that, Paul, thank you very much again. And to the audience, thank you for joining the webinar today. Uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed it and you could take away some useful information. Please join us for future webinars and have a great day. Bye-bye.